Last week we talked about God's plans, about trusting God. Sometimes we have a hard time trusting God with that 10%. Fully surrendering, fully trusting, fully believing. Maybe somebody's tried it once, but it was difficult to believe in a God that they couldn't see or they couldn't feel. They prayed one time and wondered why God didn't answer their prayer or why God allowed suffering, why God didn't meet their expectations. Well, what if the struggle had more to do with incorrect beliefs? What if the reason we're having a trouble believing in God, trusting in God, trusting in God's plans is because we're believing the wrong God? So we're in a sermon series right now. We started last week, and it's titled, I want to believe, but. I want to believe, but this or that or this or that. And we're discussing some of the things that cause us to doubt Jesus, to doubt God's plans, to doubt our faith in him, to drift away from him. And this, this week we're talking about the cultural paradigm of on demand. You know, can God be on demand when, when we need him and then put on the back burner when we're done? And I was talking with a couple of gentlemen. We were putting together some stuff for a project at the other church, and, and, and we talked about... We talked about injuries because, well, we're old. I can see Dad holding his shoulder. We're old. We got injuries. We talked about pro wrestling because we were manly men. We talked about Shark Week because we're dangerous men. We talked about restaurants because we were hungry men. We talked about boxing. And I'm sure we talked about a lot of other things, but we did talk about this TV shows. So let's, let's, let's hear some participation today for this. How many of you remember some of these old TV shows. And this goes back to y'all's age, my age too. So how many of you remember the combination of The Love Boat and Fantasy Island? Do you know the theme song for Love Boat? Come on board, we're expecting. There you go. And what did, what did the little midget say? Excuse me, little person, whatever tattoo was. What did he say every time? Zip lane, boss, zip lane. How about Happy Days and Laverne and Shirley? Who remembers those shows? Okay, so, and there was no better combination than the $6 million man and the bionic woman, right? You know, Lee Majors and, and Lindsay Wagner. But this next one, this next one doesn't have a parallel because this one stood out all by itself. And I remember sneaking down to watch this show. You know, um, so how about anybody watch Charlie's Angels? And if you know the shows, then you know that it's, 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 these are great shows. It'll, but one thing that will blow your mind, one thing that will blow your mind, and, and it's mind-boggling, but in order to watch your favorite show, you actually had to be in front of the TV at the exact moment that it came on. I know, it, it's like, what? I don't even know what you're talking about, Pastor. How is that even possible? So if your show came on, Friday night at 7 o'clock, you had to be in front of the TV Friday night at 7 o'clock, and you had to watch it all the way through, the commercials and everything. You had to watch the commercials, so, so you, know, you know you don't have any of that today. You don't have any of that today. Now you can binge watch your favorite episodes of your favorite show. How many of you all binge watched anything over the weekend? Every time I work on my sermon, I'm binge-watching one of two shows, either Midsummer Murders, which is a great British cop drama, or Family Guy. Now, don't laugh. Family Guy is a great show to have on because it's in color, it's got movement, it has noise, and you don't have to think. You can focus on your task. But we live in this on-demand society. I can get on my cell phone, which is my remote control, and I can get on my TV, and I have 17 million different things to watch on demand. I don't have to wait for it to come on. I can stream it right then. And I believe that's a problem in our society today. We live in an on-demand society. We want everything, and we want it right now. 
Because we live in an on-demand society, I believe so many people are transferring that value to God. I want an on-demand God. I want to pray for it, and I want what I want, and I want it delivered to me right now. That's why we love Amazon. We order it, and it's in our front door by the time we get off the computer. I want it delivered to me now. I want exactly what I asked for, exactly what I want, and, and here's our distorted view of God. It's, it's that we want an on-demand God. And this works great until it doesn't. And this is where some of us might be right now or know somebody who is there right now. Many people end up right here concluding, if God didn't do what I know he could have done, when I ask him to do it, then God either isn't real or he isn't powerful or he isn't good or maybe he just doesn't care. Where is my on-demand God? And the answer to that question is this. On-demand God doesn't exist. On-demand God does not exist. This is a distorted view, a distorted expectation of who God really is. We need to determine where we fit in in the grand narrative of, of creator God, of creation, of all of eternity. And here's the big thought. We need to recognize and embrace that God does not exist to serve us, that we exist to serve him. Let me say that again. Our God does not exist to serve us. We exist to serve him. And that's why, that was the fundamental thing. When I saw Rocky this morning, that's what popped in my head. Let's get them in this habit of recognizing that we exist to serve. We're not the main character in the Bible. God's the main character of the Bible. Our God is not our celestial sugar daddy, never thought I'd say that, who delivers exactly what we want when we want it. He's not the genie in the sky that if you rub him just the right way, he gives you three wishes. He's not some kind of cosmic Coke machine that if you put your money in and do something good, poof, your answered prayer pops out immediately. Well, if God is not an on-demand God, and who is he? If he's not here to do whatever I want him to do, whenever I want him to do it, then who is God? I want to give you a thought about that, about him. And I hope it stays with you and speaks to you during the week. It speaks to you in a way that will help build your faith. We need to understand that God's heart is always, always, always loving. God's heart is always, always, always loving. Let me explain it to you this way. How many in here have our, our parents or grandparents or great-grandparents? Imagine, the, you know, think back to the little kids. Or maybe you had little nieces or nephews. And I'll tell you two things about you. Two things I guarantee about every single parent that I know. Number one, there's never a time when, when you don't love your children, right? There's times when you don't like them. There's times when you want to trade them in, but you can't do it. But you always love them. There's never a time when you don't love them. And the second thing I can promise you is that is true for all of you is this. There are times when you do not do what they want you to do even though you have the power to do it, right? There are times when they're asking to do something that you have the power to do, the ability to do, and even though you still love them, you don't do it. And it could be any number of examples. And I remember this one from my kid growing up in school. Hey, kid, don't forget your lunch. Hey, kid, don't forget your lunch. Don't forget your lunch. Don't forget your lunch. Don't forget your lunch. And then you get that text, Dad, can you bring me my lunch? No. You forgot your lunch three times this week already. So go hungry today. You won't forget your lunch tomorrow. You could do it, but you don't. Or, hey, kid, do your homework. And then it's do your homework, do your homework, do your homework, do your homework. It's getting late. Do your homework. And then 10 o'clock at night, Dad, 
could you help me do my homework? No. I could, but I'm not because I love you. Because, you know, I could do something for you, but instead I want to develop something in you. You never don't love your kids. But there are times when you have the power to do what they want, but you won't do what they want, even because you love them and have a higher plan for them. And I want to look at Scripture. I want to look at Scripture that, that, that helps. Look at Scripture that helps really illustrate this powerful thought that God's heart is always loving, no matter what happens. Think about that. No matter what happens, God's heart is always loving. God could do something different. Even when something happens that you don't like, that you don't understand, that you wish it weren't so, when you know God could do something different, remember his heart. Remember his character. Remember his nature. It's always loving. So let's turn to Romans 8. Romans 8, 35. Romans 8, 35. Romans 8.35. Can anything separate us from the love of Christ? Can trouble, can suffering, can hard times, or hunger, and nakedness, or danger, and death? It is exactly as the scripture says. For you, we face death all day long. We are like sheep on their way to be butchered. And that is the word of the Lord. Amen. So Paul asked the question in the scripture. He goes, who shall separate us from what? Let's all say it out loud. Follow with me. Who shall separate us? And then he lists some things. He goes, shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? Now let's just bring this to where we live today because chances are pretty good none of you are going to be naked this week with a sword to your neck. And if you are, I want you to tell me about it, because I'm sure it's a great story. So let's modernize it, because this would be the way Paul would probably say it today. He might say, what shall separate you from the love of Christ? Shall financial trouble, shall relational hardships, shall cancer, shall unemployment, shall depression? And he answers it this way. In verse 37, he says, no. In all of these things, we are more than conquerors. Through what? Through him who loved us. He says, for I'm convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any power nor any height nor any depth nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. See, God's heart is always loving. And we need to recognize that God does not prove his love for us when he does what, he, what we want. He proved his love for us when he sent his son, Jesus, to die for our sins. So internalize that. God does not go around trying to prove his love. He doesn't go around going, okay, poof, there you go, you have it, poof. God proved his love for us. Then while we were yet sinners... Scripture says Christ gave his life for us. God's heart is always, always, always loving. He's loving when you don't understand. He's loving when you wish you were different. So remember, in all types of situations, remember, God's heart is always loving. And I hope you'll embrace the truth that his heart is always loving and that his presence is always loving. Enough. We have a hard time believing that. And it causes us to have issues with our belief where we go around going, I wish I could believe what the Bible says, but his presence is always enough. And that is where I really hope, especially, especially this year, that if, if you're what I would call one of those marginal Christians, one of those part-time Christians, one of those 
one of those consumer Christians, one of those click Christians, you know, like you come to church when you can. You kind of believe in God. You kind of believe what the Bible says. What I hope you'll do is I hope you'll recognize that you're settling for way less than God wants you to have. There is so, so much more that when you become a fully devoted follower of Christ, there's so much more. And that means you're truly seeking him first, that you're pursuing him in everything you do, that you want your life to count eternally for something more than just what's temporary. And you press into God, and you talk to him, and you feed on his word, and you worship him. What happens is, is you get to know his presence, and you start to recognize that he's always with you. He'll never leave you. He'll never forsake you. Then one day, one day something bad is bound to happen, and, but because you know him so well, you can honestly say, I don't have to worry. I don't have to worry about what's going to happen to me because I know God is with me. I don't have to worry about what's going to happen to me because I know my God is with me. And this is where David, David, from, you know, the Old Testament David, this is where David, little shepherd boy David, he became a king. He got to this intimate place with God. And before you say, Pastor, that was David. That was a man after God's own heart. You have to understand that David was a guy that threw more questions at God than any of us in the sanctuary combined. If you read his cries to God in the Psalms, it's like, God, where are you? Where are you when my enemies are after me? God, why is Saul pursuing me? This isn't fair, God. Why don't you hear my cries? And he goes on and he goes on and he goes on. He was hurting. But as he grew in intimacy with God, he started to recognize that God would never leave him. God was always with him. The same God that asked that he asked those very pressing and real questions of, you know, that he even eventually penned this in Psalm 23, 4. Let's see if anybody remembers this one. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, even though I hate it, even though I don't understand it, even though this could take my very life, even though all hell is breaking loose, even though I walk through the darkest valleys that I will fear no evil. Why? Because, God, you are with me. Because you are with me. Because you are with me, God. Because you are with me. I don't have to worry about what might happen to me because you're with me. Even though I walk through the darkest valleys, I don't have to worry because you are always with me. Now, there are times when I am convinced that God may allow you to get to a place where he's all you have. Because until he's all you have, you may never recognize that he's all you really need. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will feel no evil because my God is with me. God's ways, remember, God's ways are always loving. His ways are always higher. He is always, 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 always good and always with you. And his presence is always enough. And I know you're saying, wait a minute, Pastor. God's a powerful God. He can do what I want him to do. And yes, yeah, sometimes he does. Sometimes he hears your prayer, moves in faith, and does miracles. And you say, that's undeniably God, and you worship him when this happens. But then there are other times. Other times when he doesn't. And guess what? You worship him when that happens. Why? Because he's still good. He's still loving. And you say, but, but pastor, can't I pray and get God to do whatever I want? No, because God is not a puppet. He's the sovereign creator. He's the God of the universe. He doesn't exist to serve us. We exist to serve him. Jesus Christ did not come into this world to assist you in meeting the desires you already had before you met him. 
He came into the world to change your desires so that he's the main one, the main reason. And when we come into a right place and put him into his right place, suddenly we worship him not for just what he does, but we worship him for, for who he is, for his heart, for his character, for his nature. He is the God working in all things to bring about good to those who love him and are called according to his purpose. Because that's who he is. His heart is always loving. His ways are always higher. His presence is always enough. So whenever you're tempted to say, God, why didn't you? Where are you? Aren't you there? Are you not good? Are you not real? Are you not powerful? Do you not care? That's on-demand God. And on-demand God does not exist. The true God is so much greater. And because of who he is, our only reasonable response is, God, here I am. Take my life, my whole life. Take it and use me, God, to serve and to glorify you. Please bow your heads. Father, I pray for those who are hurting. I pray for those who are confused. I pray for those who have something they don't want. Heavenly Father, give us the, the grace to understand that your ways are higher. Give us the faith to trust that you hear our prayers and you often respond and do miracles. But God, sometimes your miracle is revealed in a way we just don't understand. We do ask and believe for a miracle. I pray for healed marriages. I pray for financial provision. I pray, God, for restoration and broken relationships with you, with others, and with ourselves. We pray for physical miracles. We know that, that you can heal bodies, that the name of Jesus is above every other name, and, and we speak the name of Jesus asking for healing, and we pray that by the power of your presence, you'd minister to each of us each of us who are struggling to believe, struggling to believe that they could still embrace you. Even when life doesn't go the way they want, knowing you're an eternal God and you're working in all things to conform us to the image of your son and to bring about good, to bring about good, God, for those who love you and are called according to your purpose. Amen.